We begin with the attacks in Paris, the quantity of news coverage, the quality, the question of terminology, and the idea of a news hierarchy, not just in the mainstream coverage, on the social media side as well. As the news was breaking, anyone on Facebook would have seen the activation of two features, a safety check-in for users in France to let others know that they were okay, as well as a filter allowing anyone, anywhere, to overlay the colors of the French flag on their profile pictures. But as Facebook was reminded, it's a worldwide web, not a Western wide web. And where were the profile filters for the Lebanese when they were attacked just the day before in Beirut? Where was the safety check-in for the Kenyan students in Garissa when they were attacked in April. As for the international news media, no one was surprised to see that Paris was getting far more coverage than other tragedies of this kind. However, the type of terminology used and characterizations made both suggest that journalists see an attack on civilians in France far differently than they saw the bombings in Beirut, Lebanon. This is still a developing story, and it tells us a thing or two about how the news media perceive things and how we, as social media users, see ourselves. Our starting point this week is the French capital, Paris. Paris suffers numerous gun and grenade attacks. Des attaques terroristes d'une ampleur sans précédent. Whether news organizations realize it or not, like it or not, they are critical weapons in the terrorist arsenal. The bombs that went off in Paris, the bullets that flew, would have all missed the larger target, the global audience, had the story gone unreported. And the social media component within the overall news equation seems to loom larger and larger with each passing story, each new headline. Social media brings us closer to these tragedies and to the victims than, than perhaps we ever have been before. It's very easy to put ourselves in the victim's shoes. We all eat at restaurants, we all go to concerts, and it brings ego into play because you're sort of inserting yourself into a tragedy that maybe you didn't witness or wasn't yours. But at the same time, that's sort of the point of these entire attacks, is that to make people afraid and make people think, that could have been me. Sometimes, social media can offer useful, even alternative narratives. However, critics of the coverage coming out of Paris, when examining social media and mainstream media, saw many of the same flaws. Facebook features offered on the tragedy in France that were not there for the Beirut bombing that happened the day before. A shortcoming, a perceived bias that was mirrored on the air and in print, given the non-stop coverage of Paris compared to the rudimentary coverage of what happened in Beirut. Generally speaking, a white death is considered more important than a brown death. This has always been the case because the media tends to be dominated by a Western vision. So when there is an attack in the Middle East, even if the death toll is more than it was here, sadly it will attract less attention. And as long as the media narrative is dominated by Western countries, that will always be the case. But also, it's realistic to think about the fact that the demand matters that consumers are interested in, in certain stories more than others. For example, the website Vox defended journalists, saying that there were many stories on the Beirut bombings, but there was not continuous coverage because it turned out there were not many viewers clicking on the stories. There's a critique of the critique now that says that we covered Beirut, but doesn't actually ask questions about how we covered Beirut. The Paris story just comes out with a headline, um, you know, people died, innocent people died, and, and it's a tragedy, and that's it, full stop. When it came to Beirut, it was, oh, these kind of people died. They were Shiites, they were Hezbollah people that died. And I think you're kind of qualifying the victims right there, which is very problematic. By creating this idea of this label of Hezbollah stronghold, you're basically assuming that everybody in that neighborhood is part of Hezbollah and kind of agrees with it. And you're almost kind of giving a bit of rationale to this killing. The Hezbollah stronghold headline was in the New York Times. After numerous complaints and plenty of online mockery, that headline was changed. 
Yasser Lawati joins us from Paris. CNN heard from the critics as well when two anchors in Los Angeles badgered a spokesman for the Muslim community in France for Muslims failing to prevent the attacks before they happened and not saying the right things after they happened. Why is it that no one within the Muslim community there in France knew what these guys were up to? To say that other Muslims should know what's happening as if they know every single member of the Muslim community in France, which is the largest Muslim community in Europe, it's not feasible and it's, it's illogical. I think CNN in particular, which has a responsibility being such a major platform, Form. It let its viewers down, it let the community down, and, and to me that's poor journalism. Can you imagine though if, if, if there was a shooting by a, a black person and they interviewed an African-American person, they said, well you must answer for the African-American community because you're also black. I mean this doesn't make any sense at all. So there is a double standard there as well. Why is it okay uh, to treat the Muslim community as one monolithic block and they're all the same and they all need to be responsible for each other and why is it not okay to do that for other communities? I'm yet to hear uh, you know, the condemnation from the Muslim community on this. But. Perhaps the CNN talking head has yet to hear of Google as well because the simplest web search, just four words, Paris, attacks, Muslim, condemns, produces millions of results and destroys his argument in a third of a second. When terror strikes, seldom are the stories seen in isolation. When Charlie Hebdo, the satirical magazine, was attacked in Paris earlier this year, that story grew into a debate on the limits of freedom of expression. This time, the attacks were tied into the influx of refugees into Europe through the reported discovery of a Syrian passport outside the football stadium near the body of a suicide bomber. The holder of this passport entered the EU through Greece in October. So this begs the question, why would a Syrian passport be found at the uh, site of the attack? Why would a suicide bomber that doesn't believe in political borders, doesn't believe in citizenship, in modern citizenship, why would they carry a passport to a suicide attack? And the answer that a number of analysts settled upon was that they wanted it to be found. Eventually, the authenticity of the passport came into question but not before the link between those two stories, immigration and security in Europe, had been made and reported widely. It turns out that one can, can very easily buy a fake Syrian passport, so it's not clear that the Syrian passport tells us much, but news agencies, I think, were too quick to report that piece of news, which leads people to draw conclusions, and in fact, many news agencies speculated and drew their own conclusions about what that passport might mean. Seeing this reaction from some pundits, from some politicians, it feeds their narrative, and the media has a responsibility to give this information, but also to think about how this information will be perceived, and with the current Islamophobia, with the current xenophobia, not just in Europe, but in the United States as well and beyond, I think that the media has a real responsibility to thoroughly look through this um, issue. Sadly, this has been used to reinforce an anti-refugee sentiment. The passport was just the pretext, and the media are not playing their role. One of the goals of the Islamic State is to create a divide between Muslim and non-Muslim communities in France, in Belgium, in Europe. So accepting this kind of debate, while Muslim organizations are clearly against the attacks, I think serves the agenda of the Islamic State. Often on this program, we document how news outlets, both public and private, can be all too willing on national security stories to let governments control the narrative. And there is some of that to this story. But what is really striking about the reporting of Paris, the interviews that are more accusatory than informative, there are so many radical Muslims, so many. The refugee stories that divide people, the propagation and the peddling of the us versus them narrative. With all of that, the media are, if not reading from ISIL's playbook, playing right into ISIL's hands. On the download now, our viewers weigh in on the coverage of the attacks in Paris. It's not just the amount of the coverage. The quality of the coverage is very different. The coverage underlines the innocence of people in Paris while it keeps repeating Hezbollah's stronghold about Beirut. We have details about concert goers in France, but not market people in Lebanon. This humanizes the Parisians, brings them closer, while Beirutis are made into casualties, not people. What I've seen on social media has been this backlash to say, well, we should care about the bombings in, in Beirut equally to the, to the atrocities in Paris. One of the most interesting ideas was this idea of tragedy hipsters 
who are wanting to go around almost in a sense of one-upmanship um, against other people to say that they know about tragedies that other people haven't even heard of. That kind of sums up the whole situation on social media right now.